everyone, we're still waiting for attendees, so let me hold on a bit. Okay, let's let's get started. Uh, so, uh, welcome everyone to this session on central bank digital currency, organized by the European Money and Finance Forum SWER and the uh, Central Bank Research Association. Um, we're we're going to have three excellent papers. Uh, we're going to first hear agent-based simulation of central bank digital currencies by Amana Ramadia um, from Financial Networks Analytics Limited. Uh, and Sijian Wang from the University of Western Ontario is gonna discuss the paper. Um, then we're gonna hear credit lines, bank deposits or CBDC, competition and efficiency in modern payment systems by Martin Schneider from Stanford. And that last, best before, expiring central bank digital currency and loss recovery by Yu Tzu. Um, uh, the discussion is gonna be Samit Ali Kijiev from the IMF. Um, we have two hours. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the split is, the presenter will take 20 minutes, then we'll have a 10 minute discussion, and then we'll have a 10 minutes Q&A. Uh, you see uh, on the, in the middle of your Zoom screen on the, on the bottom is a Q&A box. Just post your questions there. We've just agreed with the presenters that uh, all questions will be taken towards the end. So uh, of each uh, presentation. So we'll first have the presentation, then the discussion, and then collect all the questions. With that, please, Amana, take it away. Very much looking forward to your paper. Thank you, Raphael. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen well? Yeah, it yes. looks great. All right. Thank you again uh, for the opportunity that has been given to me to present a joint work with Kimo Soramaki. So I'm Amana Ramadia and I'm a data scientist at Financial Network Analytics. Maybe some of you haven't heard about the name. So FNA is a London-based deep technology company that deals with among other the application of complex networks, agent-based simulations, and also uh, machine learning to supervise and monitor financial system. As I mainly deal with our clients in Asia and Pacific region, so uh, this evening I'm joining you from Indonesia. So this paper entitled Agent-Based Simulation of Central Bank Digital Currency, and this is part of an industrial collaboration that we are doing with another company that is based in Munich called Giesk and Devriand. And then let me first discuss why we are as an industry are collaborating to, to do this um, research together. So I think the majority of the people in this call should have been aware that the rise of CBDC is undisputed. Raphael himself, I think on Wednesday has given a very nice talk on the CBDC approaches around the world, the trends, the drivers, and also the lesson learned. And this is related as well with a recent survey from the Bank for International Settlement that finds more than 80% of central banks being surveyed are undertaking extensive works on CBDC. However, the implication of CBDC on the financial system and also economic system are not known yet. And in fact, this has been one of the major roadblocks for many central banks 
regarding the introduction of these novel monetary instruments. So some, some central, central banks, for example, are still concerned on how to minimizing the disruptions and also to ensure the stability of financial sector with regards to introduction of CBDC. And then there is also another concern um, related to the structural disintermediation impact that may occur since CBDC offer a riskless alternative to bank deposits. So here we are uh, trying to look at and build a framework model um, that hopefully can help central banks and also authorities um, to accurately model and also simulate the introduction of CBDC in order to ensure the safety and also the soundness of the overall financial system. So when one is talking about CBDC, it can mean many things because there is no single exact definition on how a CBDC should look like. And then also you might probably aware that different jurisdictions now are exploring the possibility of issuing a different type of CBDC with different designs. So in this particular paper, we are interested to look at a retail central bank digital currency that will act mainly as a mean of payments in retail transactions. And there is one particular question that we look at here that is on the potential disintermediation risk, a risk that a general purpose non-interest bearing central bank liability that compete with some existing payment instruments such as cash, credit, and also debit card as a means of payments would pose. I would like to highlight here that this is an ongoing work. Um, we will provide and we, I, I will present some preliminary result, but uh, hopefully from this discussion, I would be very happy to receive any of your comment, feedbacks, um, also questions as it's an ongoing work and we are still developing the model further. So as this is an agent-based model, um, this, this um, framework can be calibrated to any jurisdiction, any central bank or any economic and financial system. But for, for the purpose of this paper, we, we are interested to calibrate the model using payment data on German retail market. And again, the objective of this model is basically to provide a tool to assess the potential implications of different CBDC designs, as well as to test the efficacy of alternative configurations of these new um, instruments. So there are a number of different streams of literature that this paper is related into. First, of course, on the um, literature of different, the impact of different CBDC designed. I think you probably are also aware as CBDC has become um, raised much interest, not only in the central bank community, but also in academic community. The literature and CBDC has been growing rapidly for the past few years. And then there are, for example, a number of studies that look at um, a way to impose holding limits of CBDC in order to cover the banking list intermediation. There, is also, there are also another studies that look at the systemic risk implications and also the monetary policy impact from introduction of CBDC. However, a few of these studies have looked at the issue from an agent-based modeling approach. Um, and th there is basically several reasons why we are interested to look at uh, this problem from an agent-based modeling approach. I think it will be even more clear when I discuss about the dynamics, but the idea here is that we are trying to simulate and uh, trying to tackle the questions, not from the macroeconomic point of view, but from more from a market microstructures uh, perspective. So there is this particular quote appeared um, in the Bank of England bulletin by uh, Arthur Turrell mentioning that, I mean, using this framework of agent-based model may be suited for analyzing the effects of different possible specifications of uh, SEBDC. And in fact, this brings us to the second stream of literature that is re related to our paper on the agent-based simulation of financial systems and also economy. Um, in, the, in, the, in the slide, you can see a figure about the semantic or the typical elements of an ABM where there are some agents living together in an environment and those agents are adapting their, their behavior with regards to interactions to other agents and also with regards to the interactions to the, to the environment. And this particular approach has already delivered some interesting results on different applications, such as on simulating the system wide stress test, modeling funding risk, simulating housing market and also looking at the payment system. So now let me um, jump 
into the block structure or the overview of our uh, model. So in particular, there are several agents, as you can see in the slide. So the first agent is central bank. There is also a commercial bank. And central banks will issue CBDC based on the commercial bank demand. And we also consider a number of consumers in the model that will, making, that will be making purchases from retailers every day. So we consider time horizon as um, one day in our model. And then those consumers and also retailers are heterogeneous with regards to uh, the type of, of personas that they have. In particular, there are a subset of consumers which aren't, uh, for example, only cash and debit card, while, sorry, while the other set of consumers aren't both um, cash and also debit cards. And the same thing applies with the retailer as well. So the, 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 the personas of the retailers and also the consumers are, are, are varied. And then, um, so I would like to clarify that in this particular model, we do not explicitly model the central bank and the commercial bank, but we mainly uh, explicitly model the interactions between consumers and retailers. Nevertheless, um, the commercial bank is implicitly in the model as the consumers need to top up their CBDC wallets from the bank deposits. So here I'm, I'm going to talk about it um, later. Uh, but the idea is that we do not assume that the consumers will convert all their CBDC one time, but they will regularly top up their CBDC based on some heuristic. And then also with regard to the retailers, if you can see at the end of the uh, figure, we also assume that at the end of the day, once the retailer receives all the um, CBDC payments from consumers, we assume that the retailer will convert their CBDC back to the commercial bank deposits. So our measure of this intermediation risk here is basically the, the amount of, or the total of CBDC outstanding in the consumer's wallet that has that come through the commercial bank deposit, but have not yet been used by the consumers to make purchases from retailers. So as I mentioned before, um, we explicitly, I mean, we particularly focus on modeling the transactions between consumers and retailers and how, let's now take a look at how we um, model those transactions between uh, these two type of agents. So in every day or in each time, time horizon, we generate uh, some synthetic transactions between consumers and merchants. And these transactions are generated based on the statistics of a given economy. So for example, um, we know that we can get from the, the data of a, a country, uh, the number of uh, retail payment or transactions that happen in a day, what is the statistics value of those payments and so on, what is the, the card ownership rate of consumers and retailers. And we first try to generate this um, kind of existing retail transactions each day. So if you take a look at the consumer's block, there are several choices that consumers um, can make per day, such as which payment instruments to hold. Uh, because as I mentioned previously that we consider heterogeneous consumers here. Also, there are other options related to the what purchases to make from which merchants and also for what number and values. And also there is another choice of which payment instruments to use. And this will depend on the type of um, payment instruments that the consumers have in their wallet or account, and also the type of instruments that the retailers accept. Meanwhile, for the merchant, the choice is limited to the, um, the card subscription or the, the, the type of payment instruments that the, the retailers will accept. So in the second step, the dynamics will be, we set up the payment migration to CBDC. And the idea is that after we generated the um, existing retail transactions, we then sample a proportion of those payments generated to CBDC. And the sampling basically depends on some exogenous adoption scenarios that, were provide, that are provided as the inputs to the model. So for example, um, we would like to see the impact of um, say some percentage of cash and debit card might being migrated to CBDC. And then also this exogenous adoption scenario is related to the um, lower and also upper bound of those uh, payments made in a, a particular instruments that are being migrated to CBDC. And then the third step, the third dynamics is related to the modeling the CBDC balance because uh, I think it is the, the very important part as we are interested to see the total amount of CBDC outstanding in the consumer's wallet or account. So again, we assume that consumers do not convert all their bank deposits 
but only as much as needed for the given transaction demand. And this is mainly because, for example, the consumers think as BCBDC is a non-interest bearing one, consumers think that putting their money into um, bank deposits is um, more profitable rather than converting all their CBDC all their money in bank to CBDC. And we also assume that the consumers will regularly top up their CBDC balance as per given heuristic. And as I mentioned earlier, um, our uh, main, so our variable of interest here is the total of consumers end of the day balance that is defined as a CBDC outstanding, which is related to our uh, measure of this intermediation risk. Now in terms of the data, um, I talk about it earlier that we generate the or we uh, calibrate the data using uh, data on German retail market from uh, previous surveys and also studies. And for parameters related to cash and card payments, such as the, the number of uh, retail transactions per day, the statistic, the mean, the maximum, minimum value of those payments are calibrated using data in Bucknell et al. and also Carbinaco White all survey from Bundesbank. There, is, there are also some assumptions with regards to the medium and maximum value of individual payment. And um, this particular parameters is based on prior work with large value payments of data. And then there are several scenarios that we consider here, but for uh, the purpose of showing you the pre preliminary result, here we take into account, um, so, so we, we put the maximum allowed CBDC balance as 150 euro. Uh, so this is the initial value that we, we put as the input to the model, but we are going to take a look and into, uh, we are going to take a look at different values of maximum allowed CBDC balance as well. And then we also assume that 50% of both cash and card payments are migrated to CBDC, which is based on some data described in the previous study regarding the acceptance of alternative to cash. So now let's take a look at the result. So uh, there are several, several things here. Um, in this table, we first take a look, we first look at the CBDC outstanding value, which is defined as the total um, CBDC, end of the day CBDC balance in the consumer's account or wallet. There is also the total of payments that are made in the, in the system per each day um, that is um, summing up across different types of instrument that is cash card and CBDC. There is also the measure of this intermediation risk that we define as the ratio between the CBDC outstanding to the total all payments um, in the system. And here we can see that, for example, in this pre preliminary result that I'm showing you that this intermediation is, uh, is about 1.05. And this may offer some economic interpretation as well. So in particular, for example, when we know that the total annual sales in the German retail sector, sector is around 410 million um, euro per year. And then assuming that consumers top up their CBDC balance every 10 days based on some statistics on um, ATM withdrawal frequency data, uh, we can actually compute that the value of CBDC outstanding is therefore around um, 12 billion euro, for example. And to put this number into perspective, um, the, this number is about 0.34% of German GDP and 0.19% of German deposits. So we can take a look at um, those kind of um, results and also interpretation. And as well as there are uh, different types of consumers that are being considered in the model, we can also take a look at the distribution of end of the day CBDC balance, frequency of CBDC top up, as well as the total value of CBDC payment in the uh, consumer's account or wallet. Now here we simply take a look at the one exact value of um, maximum allowed CBDC balance, but then what happens if we take a look at different values of maximum balance that is allowed? So here um, there are three plots and the idea here is that we are trying to show that um, maximum balance is basically a, so the CBDC outstanding and also the disintermediation risk are a non-monetary increasing, so monotonically increasing function of maximum balance where on the other hand, we can, we can see that when the maximum balance increases, the CBDC top up frequency will, will be um, decreasing um, in, in the result. So um, 
that's basically the result and also the, the model and definitions that I'm going to present today. So just to conclude that in this paper, we particularly look at one particular question on this intermediation risk. And here we consider um, CBDC that compete with a number of existing payment instruments such as cash, credit card, and also debit card. And we calibrate the data using uh, data on German retail market where we consider as well. So we mainly model exclusively hetero, uh, consumers and also merchants. And as I mentioned earlier, this is an ongoing work. There are also some further works that have been developing so far where we take a look at different number of questions the central bank might be interested to look at into, such as, such as the adoption, bank runs, financial inclusions, and also monetary policy, and where we also consider richer decision-making, um, such as the consumer's wealth allocations. There is also, since we want to model the, the banks explicitly, we are going to look at the bank's leverage and also the liquidity constraints. Um, so hopefully we are able to model, model more complete economy. Um, and then also one thing that I would like to mention, we, we try to differentiate online and offline payments such that we are able to understand as well the financial inclusion impact of introduction of CBDC. I think I have like two minutes more rather than just not doing anything. I'm just trying to show you. So we are not only building a model as a research paper here, but we are trying as well to build a nice user interface so that people or central bank can play around with the model. As you know, that agent base is very, uh, so usually agent based model has so many free parameters, but we are trying to make it more easy for people to interact with the model by, um, I mean, putting um, different parameters that they would like to consider. And then people can just simply um, start or run the simulation and trying to see how the impact of particular CBDC design. And in this example is the maximum allowed CBDC balance may look like for each day. As you can see the, the simulator runs uh, per day. We also provide the networks of the interactions between consumers and also merchants. Um, so this is in, in a group mode, in aggregated result. It's, so it is more easier for people to see how the network looks like, but we can also provide a way to see the individual nodes or, or vertices in the system. And also uh, I showed you previously that we can also take a look at the distribution. And one thing that people can play around is, for example, stopping the simulation and then changing the maximum balance to be uh, 1000, for example, from 2500. And then by running the simulation again, uh, we might be able to see that the CBDC outstanding is decreasing based on this new set of parameters. Um, so you might be able to see and, and play and interact uh, with, the, with the model that we are uh, being uh, researched for. And also some other parameters such as the daily top up that is increased when the maximum allowed CBDC balance is changing. Okay, I think, uh, my time is up, so that is from me. I hope this is useful and interesting for you. And again, as this is an ongoing work, I really hope to receive questions, feedbacks, and comments from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the discussion is CGN1 from the University of Western Ontario. You have 10 minutes. Uh, okay, thanks, Raphael. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, we see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rafael, and uh, um, thanks, Amela, for a very nice presentation. So, thank you. Thanks for the organizer for inviting me to um, to uh, discuss this paper. I really uh, enjoyed this uh, the reading it. Okay. So, uh, this paper studies a very uh, important um, uh, topic: central bank digital currency. Uh, which has attracted a lot of attention in recent years uh, from central banks. Um, there is also currently a, a very fast growing uh, literature on this topic. And some of the central banks have even uh, implemented uh, a, a CBDC. Um, so, so one of the issues um, associated with CBDC is the concern that it may compete with uh, bank deposits and lead to uh, banking disintermediation. And uh, um, this concern is uh, to some extent backed up by uh, some of the uh, existing theoretical research. So uh, this paper um, studies 
uh, banking disintermediation resulted from uh, the introduction of central bank digital currency uh, by using a, a very a novel uh, uh, approach uh, that is agent-based simulation. So uh, in the model, there are really uh, just two types of agents, uh, the consumers and the merchants. Um, it is uh, assumed that there are four types of payment instruments, cash, debit, um, credit, and CBDC. And for each consumer, uh, the, uh, the payment instrument he or she holds, um, uh, they're exogenous. Even. Okay. So the only restriction is that in aggregate, uh, the proportion of uh, 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 the uh, consumers that hold a particular type of instrument is consistent with the, the data used in the paper. Okay, so the same assumption uh, also applies to uh, the merchants. So the model is then simulated by drawing transactions from a distribution. And then each transaction is uh, randomly assigned to a consumer and merchant pair. Um, uh, there is a very simple rule to, to determine which payment uh, instrument is used in each transaction. So uh, when cars are available, that is uh, when the consumers hold the cars and the, the, the merchants also accept the cards, when that's the case, then the cards are always preferred. Um, um, and uh, if both, car, both, both debit card and credit cards are available, then uh, one of them will be chosen uh, at random. And if neither are available, then uh, cash will be used. Um, and uh, it is assumed that uh, a fraction of all transactions are forced to be conducted in CBDC. So this is how uh, CBDC is introduced uh, in the model. Okay. So the goal of this simulation is to uh, obtain a measure of this intermediation uh, under uh, some uh, calibrated uh, parameters. Okay. Uh, it should be noted that uh, um, in the model, there's no explicit decision-making um, by agents other than this uh, simple rule to determine which payment instrument is used. And there's, there are no channels through which the, the central bank may, uh, may, may implement uh, um, policies. Okay. So uh, like Amanda already uh, mentioned, um, uh, it, this, is a, 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 this paper is doing the preliminary stage. So um, um, instead of discussing again the results, um, I want to share uh, some of my ideas about what could be done in the in the next step. Okay. So uh, um, to uh, to study, for example, the adoption process, I believe it is necessary uh, for the model to uh, model explicitly the uh, decision making by agents. For example the consumers, they should be allowed to choose which payment instrument to use, and the merchants, they should be allowed to choose uh, which payment instruments to accept. Okay. And uh, the choices of consumption and production along with trading protocol uh, should also be modeled uh, explicitly. I believe uh, uh, some of these elements are already in the uh, author's plan for the next step. Okay. Uh, I, uh, to, to study the impact on banks, uh, I, I think it's crucial that bank is allowed to uh, set the prices of the debit and credit. And also the channels for uh, a policy, I think it would be nice uh, if, if, uh, if the central bank can choose the interest rate on CBDC. And also there's the question of uh, whether uh, banks can hold CBDC or not. Uh, and to study uh, this intermediation, uh, I think it would be beneficial to have uh, entrepreneurs that would need financing and also banks that play a crucial role, a, a role in, in this uh, uh, financing process. It may seem that the model is uh, becoming uh, more and more uh, complex, uh, but I, I actually think that the, uh, the one of the advantages of, of using agent-based uh, um, um, uh, models is that this kind of models, they, they allow much more complexity uh, than what is permitted in other types of models. Okay. So uh, I think this uh, should be doable. And speaking of uh, uh, this intermediation, so in the paper, it is uh, measured using the ratio between uh, the total ACPDC outstanding and total transaction revenue. I think it's nice to have a, a single, a, a simple measure of this intermediation, uh, but I also think it will be uh, interesting to also calculate the impact uh, 
uh, on, on, on interest rates and also uh, bank lending. Okay. Um, finally, I, um, I think it would be worthwhile um, um, uh, taking advantage of uh, agent-based models. Okay. So the first, uh, my first suggestion is to, to, to study the dynamics in the adoption process. I believe, the, uh, I believe uh, I'm gonna also mention this. Um, so uh, this will be interesting because I, I don't think this issue has been uh, studied a lot in the existing research. Uh, the second suggestion is um, is uh, is to model is, is maybe model the uh, uh, the bounded rationality of the uh, agents. Uh, what do I mean by that? So in the early adoption stage of the CBDC. The consumers they may not know how many merchants will accept CBDC, and the merchants may not know how many consumers will use CBDC. The banks they may be unsure uh, about uh, the impact on deposits and lending. So uh, this sort, th this kind of bounded rationality will be easy to implement in an agent-based model compared to uh, other types of models. So this will be a, a, a particular strength um, uh, of this paper if if this is. Uh, 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 implementing in a way. Okay. So just to summarize, uh, I, I think this paper tackles a, a very important issue that CPDC using a very novel approach uh, that is agent-based simulation. Um, I think there are some necessary ingredients that should be added in the next step. And I would encourage the uh, uh, authors to take on challenges that are better suitable for uh, agent-based models compared to uh, other types of models. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So um, we have we have around ten minutes. Um, let's maybe if there are some questions now. Uh, what I forgot to uh, to to say in in the intro to the session. Also, the the other speakers of the sessions, the, the speakers and the discussants are very much welcome to to raise any comments now. Just unmute yourself and, and show your video. It's it's very nice. The, dis the discussion always is nicer if, if one hears a voice and sees a person. Uh, you, for example, has a raised hand. Yeah, thanks, Rafael. Well, thanks, Amanda. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, I think uh, I, I just want to follow up on the Jan comment. I think these are very useful. It's, it's very important to think about the, so the behavior of the, the banking sector. That's how they would react to if they have some 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 profits, if they have some profit margins, you could do something uh, to, to, to counteract the adoption of CBDC. And uh, I think it's, it's good to take that into account. I also, I think it's good to think about a reinforcement learning type of model where everybody just follow up on Jen Wang's point about the dynamics, to think about everybody are just trying it out and then just try to see what's gonna happen and that and banks also figure out what their best response to these issues of CVDC stuff like that. I think uh, this extensions would be quite interesting to me. And um, next we have Martin. Yeah, the, yeah so, so interesting paper. I think so. The, the way I look at it, I mean, I'm not an expert on agent-based models, but but it seems to me it, it's at a high level kind of a, a demand system that you're modeling, where uh, people uh, choose between these different products. And so, what I'd like to understand better is how. So, so, so if so, in IO, there are, there are these uh, uh, demand system based on discrete choice, where there's some choice, and then there's a lot of randomness because in the microdata, there is a lot of uh, preference strokes and stuff that we can't really understand. And I think these random these components that you have in your model are playing kind of a similar role. And so then sort of the key thing in this, in this demand system estimation is how do you sort of identify the, the, uh, the elasticity of demand? And we'd be curious kind of how the calibration of, of these types of models uh, deals with that. And I then, I mean, I really like uh, Zijan's idea of the, the, the dynamics that's in this model could help uh, make clear how an adoption process works. Um, and th that is also something that, that uh, in IO people have, have thought about, maybe a connection could be made uh, so that the, the model could be kind of trained on uh, adoption processes that we've already seen 
uh, where elasticity of demand change over time. And then uh, that could be used to make uh, projections for how the CBDC works. So, okay, so uh, uh, I'm very, very happy with uh, all the comments and also questions. Um, I will start with um, the- oh, uh, Sorry, I had a question to, uh, if, if there's some time. Maybe, yes. yeah, there is some time, maybe, I mean, there, I also have, maybe we, we have one round of answers and then another set of questions. Okay. Or maybe we can, so, maybe you can ask and then I will you, try to. You want to connect? Oh, okay, let's connect. Oh, yeah. Please connect. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just, yeah. Uh, so sorry to sorry to uh, interrupt and me. So uh, thanks for the presentation, Amana. I, uh, I I would like to you know understand the model in in, in more detail as to. Uh, I think as of now, the model doesn't have any uh, you know trade-offs as to which instruments. What are the benefits or costs associated with with any of these instruments, right? Like why why do I hold a CBDC and not a deposit? You mentioned that deposit pays interest, but the CBDC doesn't. So why does anyone, for that matter, choose between a debit card or a uh, you know, cash or CBDC? Maybe I would like to uh, you know, understand this, whether whether uh, you know your model has to say something more about this. Uh, and related to that is, in your model, as of now, what is it that we that we learn from these simulation processes? If I understand it correctly, there is an empirical distribution that you incorporate, and there is, you know, most of it is uh, is exogenous and and kind of a random matching between retailers and consumers. So, as of now, what is it uh, that we learn about uh, uh, about the CBDC uh, implementation process? Oh, thanks, that, that was it. And pardon me for my ignorance about uh, agent-based mod modeling. No problem, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Amana, let me, let me also chime in here. The, uh, I, I, I think, you know, I, I, th I think that just echoes what the discussion has been saying and all these questions. In the central banking community, we're really, we're really, really, really thinking about business models and use cases. And, and so just, you know, these, the interaction of these two, like why would a consumer choose to pay with a CBDC? And, and here, right, the margin is fees for payments and the interest rate on the balance. Those are the, the, the parameters, I guess, that could be easily nested in your model with some rationality. And I think the Bank of Canada has some nice working papers on sort of how people choose to pay and what welfare gains from different payment options are. Uh, and, and, and I think, you know, that's really something that all central banks of the world are looking at is like, what will it actually take to make a CBDC used? And what is, and that's, I think, there, there's where your model could be really helpful. The trade-off between having a CBDC used a lot in payments and not leading to massive disintermediation, right? I think, you know, that's, that's, I'm, I'm asking all central bankers who are in the, in the audience to, to chime in here. But I think that's really the, the frontier that we want to move. And we want to, you know, we want to be with a lot of payments and with very little disintermediation. How can we get there? And that's where these kind of models could be super informative in my view. But uh, sorry, back to you. Um, maybe if you can, can keep it to three minutes and then we move on to the, to the next uh, Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, th thank you very much. I think uh, those are very helpful comments and also questions. Um, even though there are different, I mean, uh, panelists that are, have, I mean, giving the comments, but I think they're somehow basically in, uh, I mean, similar type of comments and also questions. So uh, basically it is correct that in this model, everything is still, so there is no not really rationality in this current version of this model. So basically for everything, as Vision mentioned, um, we, 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 we take into account the exogenous, for, exogenous, for example, adoption. So we don't really consider now, I think uh, with regard to the Kunal's question as well, we, don't, we do not have any 
we don't simulate any wealth allocation on how basically consumers um, are trying to migrate from one instrument to the other, and then whether why actually the cost benefit of using credit credit compared to a CBDC. But in this version, is that we 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 mainly generated the existing tra retail transactions based on some statistics, and then we force that number of proportions of those generated transactions will be migrated. So basically, um, the, the, ado the adoption rate at this moment, at this stage, is uh, an exogenous input to the model rather than some um, behavioral rule that uh, being considered in the model, which I believe with all the uh, comments that it is very crucial as it is also an agent-based model. And one can, so, so also the idea of, uh, as Vision mentioned earlier, the idea of why we are trying to look at this from the agent-based model is that we are trying to build much more complex um, simulation uh, while we start from a very simple basic um, of model that you have just uh, seen before. And uh, thank you as well, Raphael, um, about mentioning the what questions or topics that the central banks community are very interested in, in terms of the business model and use cases. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very nice comment. Um, we will be thinking a lot about how to basically answer these questions. And then I think one more question from Kuna is what can we learn from the current simulation is that when the when giving when given some so what, what can we learn is that given some statistics of existing payment system, especially the retail transactions market, and then some exogenous adoption scenarios, we can we can try to see how the this intermediation risk and also the top up frequency of the consumers in the in the, in the financial system will change based on um, a different design of CBDC with regards to the maximum allowed CBDC balance that each consumers can 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 top up to their account. So that's the thing, how these um, maximum allows the central bank impose the system will impact the amount of this intermediation risk and also the behavior of top up frequency in the system. I think I have over, I'm taking more than three minutes, so I'm, I'm very sorry about that. But then thank you very much uh, about all your feedbacks and co comments. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting paper. And it, it really, like, this really speaks to a lot of policy questions that central bankers are thinking about. The next paper is by Martin Schneider, Credit Lines, Bank Deposits, or CBDC, Competition and Efficiency in Modern Payment Systems. Please take it away, Martin. Is this working? Yes, it's working. Perfect. All right. So yeah, thanks a lot for, for having us. This is joint work with Monica PSV. And um, this uh, is a contribution to this uh, rapidly growing literature on, uh, on CBDC that discusses uh, various different proposals um, for this talk, what we're going to be focusing on is uh, CBDC as an interest-bearing reserve account for everyone. And our main point is that we should think about uh, CBDC in the context of uh, the broader market for liquidity that not only uh, contains bank deposits, but also credit lines as an important means of payment. Currently, uh, this market is served by commercial banks, which means that the same intermediary offers both of these products, bank deposits and credit lines. And uh, it exploits a complementarity that uh, helps shorten balance sheets if the same intermediary uh, offers both and that uh, lowers operating costs. And what that means is that uh, when you put CBDC as a new product that is not complementary to credit lines, um, that may be beneficial, but is only beneficial if it is a lot cheaper to produce than deposits because it uh, does not have this complementarity attached to it. That's in a, in a nutshell, the message of the paper. Um, the mechanism uh, relies on an externality between liquidity providers, uh, in this case, the central bank and the commercial banks. Um, and as such, it applies not only to CBDC, but also to, uh, to other uh, innovations like stable coins or to past innovations like money market funds. All right, so uh, this is a theoretical paper. Um, and uh, as there are many now, 
Um, so uh, there are these irrelevant theorems that say that uh, allocations uh, after introduction of CBDC uh, can be the same under certain conditions. And then there, there are a couple of uh, uh, mechanisms that people have modeled, uh, the, the effect on bank lending, uh, the effect on market power deposits, security management, financial stability, et cetera. The new thing here is that uh, there is this uh, um, competition with credit lines. Um, and uh, that, that uh, idea of credit lines as payment instrument builds on a, a large literature in corporate finance where uh, this has been modeled and has been uh, empirical evidence has been provided. Uh, and also where this complementarity at the individual bank level has been pointed out. Um, kind of the new thing there for, for us is that there's this, uh, this complementarity in general equilibrium uh, generates this externality between payment providers that can make it actually worse to have competition between CBDC or money market funds and banks that offer both products. All right, so I will, uh, in the uh, 20 minutes, uh, not present you the model with equations. I will uh, sketch it and I will show you some diagrams that, that give you the intuition. But there's plenty of equations in the paper. Uh, you, could, you could go to those if you like what you see here. Um, so this is a, um, the, 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 the body of the model, the core of the model is a fairly standard uh, neoclassical growth model. Uh, and uh, then the, what we put into it uh, to generate a need for, for payments is unpredictable liquidity. So we start from kind of standard preferences and technologies. There's households that work and consume goods. And we're gonna have complete financial markets which allow the uh, showing a representative household. And uh, there's competitive firms that make goods from capital and labor. And also there, there's uh, investment goods producers that make capital from goods. And then uh, these agents are subject to liquidity constraints. Uh, in particular, the buyers of goods, which are the households and the capital producers, gonna need payment instruments uh, before they buy. And uh, the unpredictable liquidity needs are that only a share uh, V of these guys uh, gets a chance to, to actually buy. Um, and then uh, the sellers, uh, which are the producers of goods, they're gonna need the payment instrument after selling. And here, the liquidity needs are predictable. Uh, so these guys are just gonna store the funds in order to pay the wages and the rents later. Um, and then uh, there are also banks who provide payment instruments. And uh, they are also subject to liquidity constraints because they may need payment instruments to meet customer outcomes. So uh, let me say more how these, uh, these banks offer payment instruments. So there are two uh, flavors. One is deposits. And the key thing of a deposit is you got to hold it before the trade. Then you spend it if you need it, if your liquidity shock shows up. And otherwise, you keep it. Okay. Um, in contrast, uh, a credit line is a contingent instrument. You arrange it. And then you draw it down to receive a loan if you need it. But otherwise, you don't use it. Um, and so, so, so this means that you can see what, what the advantage of a credit line here is that, that uh, you can avoid holding things on the balance sheet that you may not need. Um, okay, uh, now uh, there is costs for producing uh, in financial instruments in this model. And uh, we're gonna have first kind of a, a fairly standard collateral constraint that says that debt uh, is less than some of, uh, multiple fee times the value of assets. And then uh, uh, the, the key uh, friction is that there will be asset management services, kappa, per unit of assets. Um, uh, and those, those are resource costs, the, the goods that have to be purchased, that's a price fee. So think of this as there's a, a delegation of uh, asset management, there, there's some underlying problems, moral hazard, et cetera, and then, then it just takes uh, costs to, to um, mitigate those. Uh, and, and so these are resource costs. These, these asset management services require capital and labor. And that is a force in the model that says that we want to keep the balance sheets short. And that, that's the, the, the very important. OK, now, otherwise, the capital markets are, are fairly boring. So there's costless adjustment of equity in the banks and the firms every period. Um, we're also going to uh, make the equilibrium size of banking small relative to the capital stock. So in contrast to a lot of the discussion of uh, CBDC in the literature, in this model, the banks are not important for lending to provide investment. Okay? 
They're important for providing liquidity to, for, to capital goods providers, but that's a separate thing. So here, it's not the case that if you somehow have this intermediation, then you can't uh, grow the economy uh, in, in the sense of there, there's not enough investment. That's, that's absent. The, the banks are only liquidity providers. Um, and uh, then uh, we, we, for simplicity, we say that households and banks and the central bank can invest directly in capital, but that could be easily uh, embellished because the basic is a regarding equivalence and Morgan and Miller uh, results hold, uh, except for these liquid instruments. Otherwise, everything is frictionless. All right, so um, this is the uh, um, sketch of the model. And now uh, the model is uh, quite tractable. Uh, in the sense that you can characterize the equilibrium allocation as the solution to a planner problem with a resource constraint that's got uh, extra, extra liquidity costs on uh, consumption and investment and output. <laughs> and those are um, there are formulas for these things. Uh, those depend on the details of the payment system. Okay. And so then when you think about what are the real effects of the payment system, uh, basically a more costly payment system looks like having a less efficient production technology. And uh, then we can sort of figure out what's the, how does the allocation respond? And that's basically like in the neoclassical growth model um, where, where if you had these kind of technology shifters. Um, and this may be different by sector. For example, if you have a larger, uh, transaction costs on investment relative to consumption, then you have a payment system that discourages investment relative to consumption. All right, so how do we get from the, so I gave you all this description of the model with all these agents and stuff, and then and how do we get to this, this uh, planner problem? So this, I wanna give you the intuition how that works um, and what that means for the steady state welfare for different payment systems. So I wanna summarize uh, for the purpose of this talk, the predictability of liquidity needs by this one number V. Uh, and uh, then I'm going to show you kind of a balance sheet under different payment system before and after trades and link those to the liquidity costs that come out. And that's gonna uh, uh, allow us to compare and evaluate the different systems. Okay, so here's the first one. This is uh, a world in which banks uh, offer only the profits. And so then, uh, you know, uh, before trade, the buyers are going to have to have some deposits this year. And um, then after trade, um, the, some of these we have gone to the seller. So trade means that uh, a share V of these buyers uh, get, to, get to spend. And so V times the deposits goes to the seller and one minus V stays with the buyer. And that's the stuff that's not used. And uh, then this is provided for by the banks. The banks uh, hold some capital and they have uh, deposits and equity. Uh, and then um, the um, after trade is the same. It's just that something changes, like the, who owns the deposits changes, but the balance sheet of the banks does not change. So that's the, uh, that, that's how the deposit system works. Now, how does, how do, this is financial positions, the deposits and equity and capital and stuff. Uh, how does this relate to the uh, transactions? So we can write the, um, uh, using the liquidity constraints, the deposits in terms of the uh, uh, transaction volume, consumption and investment. And then we have that uh, the deposits that the buyers have, this is consumption plus investment that gets made divided by V. Okay, so this is because there is, so this is more than the consumption plus investment uh, that is made in a period because there is this kind of precautionary holdings of deposits. Um, not everybody will uh, be able to spend. Um, and so then you can see that you take all these positions here and relate them to uh, transactions that uh, lead to the positions being taken. And uh, then sort of going through this, you could, you could come up with an expression for uh, these costs uh, that, that go along with uh, holding uh, things on balance sheets, uh, and these are, this is, now we don't have to go through all the terms of the formula, but this is just a proof of concept is that then, then one can figure out uh, with a bit simple algebra, what are these, uh, what are these costs? Okay. And now just intuitively what this captures here, the, the, the properties of banking with deposits are that liquidity uh, costs are high, 
If the liquidity needs are quite unpredictable, that means that this V is small, which means that there's a lot of these precautionary deposit holdings that we have to do. Um, and then the second thing is that, so we uh, have that uh, investment is uh, extra costly in a world with deposits only because firms are not natural savers. They want short balance sheets. Uh, and so for in a deposit world, it's not only costly to have deposits on the uh, balance sheet of banks, but also specifically on the firms. And uh, so that, that uh, generates extra distortion. Okay, so that's deposits. Now let me turn to uh, um, having deposits and credit lines. Okay, so, so in fact, let's look at a world in which everybody uses credit lines for purchases. Um, the before trade period is now very boring because uh, at least we look at balance sheets because uh, there's nothing on them. Right? The credit lines are contingent liabilities, they're off balance sheet. And so nothing needs to be uh, put on a balance sheet before trade. And so there's no costs accrued there. And then after trade, what happens is that, that there's going to be this share V of uh, buyers that get to spend, that they're going to uh, take out the loan uh, based on the credit line that they've arranged. And uh, then that um, money goes to the sellers. And um, it, what the banks do is they, uh, they create a deposit uh, to match uh, the, the loan. And so those things here, you see the, the complementarity comes where the, the loan goes on the asset side of the balance sheet and the deposits go on the liability side. And then because of the um, borrowing cost rate, the, the banks also uh, buy some capital and they have some equity. Um, and so, so, the, so the main uh, visual impression that you take away is that in the world with credit lines, balance sheets are a lot of shorter. And according to what we said before, where there's these, these uh, balance sheet costs, asset management costs, uh, this will make things cheaper. And so we could, um, again, relate this to the, uh, uh, transaction volumes and uh, get a resource constraint with and without credit lines. And you see that you know, the one with credit lines up here, it's much less messy. That actually means that uh, uh, welfare is higher, uh, there's less costs. Um, basically, uh, the welfare gains from credit lines are that they avoid precautionary holdings of deposits. And that is as if there is higher TFP in our model. Uh, they avoid the firm's balance sheet costs the firms be not being natural savers. And this is like investment specific technology progress. And um, then uh, there is this complementarity of the products of the bank at the banks, which also uh, translates in a higher TFP. Okay, so that's uh, that's it. So we have a, a world with a uh, growth model with uh, unpredictable liquidity needs and credit lines is a valuable object here, a valuable arrangement. So what happens when there is entry of uh, generally some deposits only intermediary. Um, so this is some new intermediary. It's got some maximum leverage ratio of five star, and it, it uh, has to pay some asset management costs kappa star. And the leading example that we use to label everything is that this, is, uh, this intermediary is a central bank and the product is central bank digital currency uh, that's offered at marginal cost. Um, but uh, as I said earlier, that is because now we're doing this sort of margin cost pricing here, if you just had a stable coin that enters and, uh, and there's, or there's a competition between stable coins, all, all the arguments gonna work the same way. Um, okay, so, so then this is gonna compete with the banks that we had before that offer credit lines and deposits. And the question is, is that better or not? <laughs> okay, so two simple points first. Um, this can only improve things if the new technology is, uh, is better in some way, right? So we need to have, uh, in particular, that um, the ratio of the asset management cost uh, divided by the um, maximum leverage uh, parameter is lower for the entrant than for the existing banks. And that could be either because this new entrant is better at asset management, maybe the case for a uh, Stable coin, or is better able to commit uh, to repay debt, so can can uh, lever more. This may be for for a central bank. And so um, this uh, <coughs> this is a necessary condition for for wealth to go up. Okay. Second point. Second simple point is that um, if banks only offer deposits and not credit lines, then this, uh, having this entrant, which, which has this uh, better technology in the sense justifying, is always better. 
Okay, so then what would happen is, well, all the depositors are going to migrate to the central bank, uh, commercial banks are going to disappear altogether. Uh, in this model, as I said, uh, there is no value to banking other than liquidity provision. Now we can do it better uh, with the central bank, and so that's, that's great. Yeah. This is not a problem for investment. In fact, investment is going to increase because liquidity is cheaper. And all this kind of constraining lending stuff that's not in this model. Banks only provide liquidity. Um, so that, those are the two uh, simple points. Now, the, the uh, subtle point, interesting point, is what happens uh, if, if the uh, banks also offer credit lines? Uh, is the CBD still good? Okay, so this is more complicated because now we got to think about buyers and sellers' choice of payment instruments, right? So, so far, there's just uh, deposits and uh, CBDC, and then you just, it, those, are, those are perfect substitutes, so you take the cheaper one. Or if the and price just, is the same, then there's- just to um, just to if you, you have about two minutes left, just to, yeah. sort of to give you like, not super hard limit, but just to give you a sense. Sorry? It's not a super hard limit, but just to give you a sense of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the, the, these, um, the deposits and CVC, when they're, if the price is the same, then the customers are indifferent. And then they still have to decide between should they use a deposit or CVC uh, and credit line. And that is going to depend on the predictability of the liquidity needs. Because uh, if, if my liquidity needs are less predictable, then the credit line is, is better, as we were saying before, because I don't want these precautionary holdings. Um, and so in this talk, I'm going to just focus on the case where all the uh, buyers continue to use credit lines. In the paper, we do the, the case where there's a switch as well. Um, OK, now, uh, this is the, the response of the uh, Consumers now. What's going to be a response of the commercial banks? Uh, they have now this uh, this competitor that that undercuts the previous uh, deposit rate, and so uh, they still want to uh, issue deposits. So then, for that, they got to match the, the higher interest rate, that's uh, or the lower price of liquidity that, uh, that the CBDC offers. Um, and in order to do that, what they, what what they'll do is they're going to increase the price of the credit line in order to break even. Okay, and, then, and this is, a, is kind of the distortion to the credit line uh, market uh, that, that it will be costly. Um, it increases the funding costs of these commercial banks and makes it uh, no longer uh, profitable to invest in capital. Okay, so we can look at the, the asset positions here. Um, so it, there's a bunch of stuff going on. It's, it's best to, to start here. So this the same uh, logic because we assume that um, people remain uh, with credit lines, that th this is, looks the same as before. And now just sort of the underbelly of how this is arranged uh, is a little bit different in that there is a, um, the, the, uh, the banks have to create uh, deposits here, um, but there will be an outflow of funds uh, to the central bank. And in order to prepare for that, the bank has to hold uh, uh, liquid assets uh, already before uh, at the central bank, and this makes the balance sheet longer than in a world in which the uh, there is only credit lines. Um, okay, so uh, this can then again be translated into uh, our uh, resource costs and we compare constraints. And the main result of the paper is that the CBDC improves welfare if and only if this inequality holds, which says that um, if only the CBDC is sufficiently cheap. Uh, to offset uh, this uh, this uh, this cost, and so uh, if if it's really cheap enough, the new uh, entrant the, or the CBC then is better. But if it's only marginally better, then it's actually welfare reducing. Yeah. And uh, this there, sort of, there's uh, the key thing for that is that this uh, competition for deposits is going to distort the price of the credit line. It's in fact. Uh, the liquidity constraints of the banks, uh, which is was present in the picture and before it, is not essential for the result. Uh, it, even in the limit, would, would hold. Um, and uh, so this effect is there. Uh, if you just have this new entrant price at marginal cost, so it works also when there are just uh, competition between deposit-only intermediaries that are not to, uh, not allowed to put great lines. Because uh, it's this externality among the liquidity providers who jointly support the transaction that uh, uh, buyers and sellers uh, make transactions, and there is multi there's competition between multiple liquidity providers uh, that supports that. 
this means that these hybrid payment systems uh, incur higher costs like deposit only system and unlike uh, credit line systems. Good, that's it. Um, so uh, CBDC, to think about CBDC is important to take the broader view of a market for liquidity that includes credit lines. And once you do that, there is a counterforce uh, to that even in, if, if the uh, CBDC is cheaper than deposits, uh, that may be welfare reducing. Thank you very much. Um, the discussed is Kunal Kainar from Toulouse School of Economics. Uh, okay. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, this was a very, very interesting paper. It was a great learning experience. So what this, uh, what is this paper about? Uh, the paper has a very ambitious uh, objective uh, to assess the welfare gains of introduction of a CBDC. CBDC in this context has to be understood as a narrow bank. That is a bank which provides only deposit services, but not a credit line. So in this model, CBDC is basically equivalent to a narrow bank. As against the commercial banking system, which offers both deposits and credit line. So uh, the, the core of the paper is really uh, the complementarity between deposits and credit lines and how it can improve uh, efficiency uh, of the financial system. The key trade-off uh, that uh, the paper discusses is that on one hand, you have a cheaper uh, deposit provisioning by the CBDC or the narrow bank because it has uh, you know, an advantage in providing deposit services. But on the other hand, it increases the number of balance sheets and thereby the balance sheet costs. And it could, in fact, lower the provisioning of credit lines. And this is uh, the costs and benefits associated uh, with the introduction of the CBDC. The net effect, uh, in fact, uh, could be that CBDC, in fact, would reduce the welfare uh, unless and until uh, the benefits are substantial. And to summarize the paper, the, the key assumptions which are driving these results are the balance sheet costs. Uh, that is, if your balance sheet size increases, you have to incur additional costs. So what is this model about? Uh, the, the very nice thing about uh, the model is that at the background, it is uh, the neoclassical growth model, uh, which has, you know, as usual, household firms, capital producing firms, and so on. To this, uh, they, they incorporate a demand for liquidity in the form of a demand, uh, uh, in, a, in the form of a cash in advance constraint. So uh, individuals or agents uh, require liquidity and uh, there are also idiosyncratic liquidity shocks, which makes uh, the demand for liquidity unpredictable for some agents. So the key, uh, uh, you know, the question is, what do I do? Whether I go for uh, bank deposits if I have liquidity needs, or I uh, go for credit lines. Uh, the, intuitively, agents with more predictable demands, like in this uh, case, uh, the final goods producer, they could opt for bank deposits. Uh, whereas uh, agents which have more unpredictable demands, uh, they could, uh, you know, uh, prefer credit line. So in equilibrium, we could have both. Uh, just uh, at the cost of repetition, uh, Martin has already taken us through this very nice graph. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this first uh, table is when there are no credit lines and there is only the deposit payment system. So here, if I want to have liquidity, I must hold something even in the first period before the transaction takes place. Uh, so I hold deposit with the banking system. The banking system in turn, in turn has its own uh, balance sheets funded by uh, debt and equity. After the transaction, uh, the seller steps into uh, uh, the shoes of the uh, buyer and the seller in turn now holds the deposits. So essentially the, the two periods means that there are uh, two balance sheets, as you can see, for the bank, and thereby 
at both times you will have to incur costs. With the credit line, this is a contingent contract. Uh, in the first period, uh, you don't have to have any anything held uh, with the banking system. Only if the need arises, you draw the credit line. So thereby, uh, the seller, uh, when he receives the payment, now holds the deposit, and the buyer to make the payment has to uh, have the credit line from, from the bank, and this happens simultaneously. So the bank, when it lends, automatically and simultaneously creates a deposit, which is held by some other agents who may have heterogeneous liquidity demands. And thereby, uh, you have this perfect negative correlation, uh, which gives rise uh, to the complementarity, which in simple terms is basically that now uh, there is no balance sheet in the first period, uh, so there is no cost. After transaction, you have some balance sheet, which is actually smaller in size, so smaller are the costs. And thereby, uh, the credit line system uh, is more effective than an only deposit uh, contract system. The key assumption uh, is, again, uh, the, these balance sheet costs. And these costs are basically asset management services, which they call CAPA. And they scale uh, linearly with the balance sheet size. Another important, I won't say assumption, but the key feature of the system is that the central bank uh, does not invest into credit lines or it does not lend to the banking system. If it receives uh, the deposit, it will invest into some other assets, yeah, so, uh, but not credit lines. Finally, there is also a leverage limit or a collateral constraint which limits the size of the balance sheet. Now, the key finding of the paper, uh, before that, let's, uh, you know, let's go to the second graph, where I like now compare the credit line system that we just discussed, which was more efficient uh, with the CBDC based system. Now with the CBDC based system, what happens or with the narrow bank, the balance sheet gets split up. Now in the first period, uh, because the uh, banks are going to lose their deposits, they have to fund themselves with equity and now they have to hold liquid reserves with the central bank. Now you see two more balance sheets have popped up. After the transaction, uh, the bank now extends uh, the credit line uh, to uh, the buyer and now the seller holds the deposit with the CBDC. As you can see, now the system is more expensive uh, because of additional balance sheets. Every balance sheet here is expensive, whether it is uh, the agent's balance sheet or the commercial banks or the central bank. So a CBDC or a narrow bank, uh, basically uh, what it does is it removes the automatic deposit funding which the banking system had. So the banking system now is funded totally by equity. On the other hand, the narrow banking cannot invest into credit lines, so it is invested into other assets. So uh, the complementarity essentially uh, goes away. So because of this, unless and until the CBCC system is super advantageous in terms of provisioning of these services, uh, CBDC may in fact reduce the welfare. Uh, so uh, let me now discuss some of the key assumptions. So uh, all these results, as you can see, uh, are driven by these asset management services or these balance sheet costs. So it would be really nice to, to see and uh, you know, in real life, what do these uh, services mean or uh, you know, some empirical section which tries to understand what are these costs, how significant they are in quantitative terms. Uh, so also whether these costs are, do we see in the data that these costs are linear uh, and they scale with uh, the size of the balance sheet or is there a potential for economies of scale uh, where you know, even if the, uh, the costs may increase but they may not increase uh, in a linear fashion. So also these costs could, could differ across asset classes. So maybe if I invest into liquid government securities, my balance sheet costs could be different as compared to, uh, let's say if I invest into risky mortgages. So I think uh, I would like to understand in, in greater detail as to what these uh, costs are. Uh, just to be provocative, uh, we see that the banking system rather has a tendency to expand its balance sheets and to take you know, additional leverage whenever it, it gets a chance. So uh, probably you know, it, it doesn't appear that uh, these balance sheet costs 
hinder the expansion, at least their private incentives to do so. Having said that, uh, now the second uh, more critical uh, uh, thing that I would like to discuss is the structure of the CBDC. So, uh, you know, CBDC is how you structure it. In this particular paper, CBDC is equivalent to a narrow bank. However, we could think of uh, different structures uh, within the, uh, the model provides us the opportunity to discuss different structures within this framework. One could be where the central bank issues deposits, but at the same time, it could provide the liquidity support back to the banking system, meaning that uh, the banking system loses the deposits, but in turn, the central bank uh, could uh, fund uh, the banking system, same as in, in you know, Brunner, Meyer, and uh, Niepel result. And the model uh, could then uh, talk about whether uh, the, the loss of complementarity between the credit lines and deposits could be reinstated. Uh, now, there is a, a small section in the paper which tries to, uh, tries to discuss this, but there again, uh, it boils down to the balance sheet costs or the asset management costs, uh, unless and until uh, these are very low. According to the model, it may not uh, serve the purpose. Finally, uh, why this lending uh, could be, uh, that is the lending of uh, the central bank to the banking system could be interesting is because there could be other benefits of uh, CBDC, which uh, the model right now does, does not discuss. Just to give you, uh, you know, a brief idea about what, uh, what I mean by this is that Let's say we have a system where you have commercial bank lending to the buyers and accepting deposits from the sellers. We could split the balance sheet as in the paper, just that now when the central bank issues CBDC, it also lends to the banking system, uh, thereby completing the loop. And uh, you know, we could explore the equivalence between the two, two systems. Now, where this could be interesting is, uh, if there are some more risks uh, to the banking system, for example, uh, there could be aggregate uh, liquidity risk in the form of banking runs, as in bank runs, as in uh, Diamond and Dibwick. Uh, so also there could be default or insolvency uh, risks to the banks. If, if you uh, think about these risks, uh, I, I have a, a related paper about uh, central bank digital currency uh, where I show that with the system that I just discussed, where you uh, also support the banking system, the CBDC could in fact improve financial stability by ruling out number one, the bank runs. And secondly, it could help pooling together the credit or default risk of the banking sector and diversifying the default risk, thereby providing uh, you know, a risk-free return to the depositors. In a nutshell, CBDC could emerge as a substitute for deposit insurance without facing uh, the distortions associated with it. So to, to sum up, I think this was a great learning experience for me. Uh, this paper is probably the first paper to focus on the complementarity between credit and deposit creation uh, in the context of the CBDC uh, literature. And it was refreshing to look at a model uh, which talks about uh, simultaneous credit creation um, through lending by the bank. So, uh, so this uh, this was a, a fantastic uh, learning learning experience for me. Uh, and the main message for me uh, from this paper is that, is as follows: huh? that, that CBDC may not, not be such a great idea if it only amounts uh, to a na narrow banking system. So, I think going forward, uh, you know, this this paper could guide future research as to what could be uh, the, the potential structures we could think of which and potential advantages that the CBDC could offer uh, to, uh, to make a comprehensive uh, welfare analysis uh, of uh, the introduction of a CBDC. Uh, that's Thank you very all. much. Thanks. Kunal. Um, we, so we're a bit over time now. We, uh, if we were to stick to schedule, we wouldn't have any discussion, but I think we should have a discussion. Um, let's let's collect a couple of questions uh, and then Marty I'm going to ask you to to answer everything at the uh, together at the end and then let's try to move to the next paper at 
let's say 15, 27, 28, and we'll go into overtime by seven, eight minutes with the session so that the last paper has the full time. But in the meantime, uh, I, I ask the panelists to raise their hand if they have a questions or the attendees to put a question in the Q&A box. Um, I, um, I, I want to ask, ask one, uh, uh, and, and, and I think this is super, it's a super interesting mechanism. And, and it, it, you know, definitely if we want to think about the macroeconomic implications of CBDC, we need to go beyond equivalent results. We need to go via just, you know, the magnitude of relative balance sizes. And we need to go in these micro foundations. And I think it's very interesting. And, and, but there is no aggregate risk, right? And, and in, if you think about the structure of the current system, right, there's public liquidity that supports private liquidity. And, and I wonder whether you could amend your model with a Holmstrom Troll type of, of mechanism um, where there is aggregate risks and then a CBDC also distorts the relative margins of, of, of you know, how an aggregate shock will affect banks uh, and, and, and just so how you would think about fitting risk into your model framework. And uh, the next question is by you. Martin, thanks. It's very interesting. I, I have one quick question about the market structure in the banking sector. In the model, uh, it seems the banks are competitive. I'm wondering how, how, how important that is in the results. Of course, you have uh, imperfectly competitive banking. So but what, what happens? So what I learned from the joint work with Jonas and Mohammed, uh, that, that, that seems you can get into a situation where CBDC is not used at all, which seems not to destroy the the the, 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 the complementarity, but it can improve welfare just by by disciplining the bank's behavior. I'm just wondering what what your thought on that. Thank you. Many thanks. Then we have a raised hand by Arno. Yeah, um, I have a short question, and not to Martin, but to Kunal. Uh, I think you said in your discussion that that you have a paper that 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 shows that a CDBC could be a substitute for bank deposits, and 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 I, I find it rather interesting because it's it's quite counterintuitive. That's what that's not what central bankers would typically think about immediately. So could you could you tell us a little bit the intuition behind that result? I would be quite quite interested to know. Thanks. Okay, so whose answer do we take first? <laughs> so, so, Maybe, uh, Kunal, you want to answer one, two minutes, and then we pass it to Martin? Yes, yes. So, uh, so um, thanks, Arno. So, uh, so for, for the second, uh, so the idea is, is actually uh, quite simple. If you have uh, the central bank lending to the entire banking system, essentially what happens is if whatever... Uh, the expected defaults uh, could be priced into the lending rate from the central bank to the banking system, uh, thereby uh, whatever uh, is whatever whatever are the actual defaults uh, minus uh, the lending rate will give you the the risk free rate, and thereby this risk pooling will help uh, you to earn a risk free rate. And this is only possible if the central bank actually takes charge of uh, the entire uh, commercial banking assets. And this has other, uh, you know, implications that uh, you are able to provide uh, a risk-free rate, uh, which is like a deposit insurance, but you are not facing the distortions that are generally associated with the with the deposit insurance. About the liquidity runs, uh, one thing is that uh, in in my model there is a cash in advance constraint and there is a role of cash, and the central bank is able uh, or has the monopoly of issuing cash in exchange of a CBDC. So uh, any attempt to run against a CBDC uh, will not be fruitful. And also there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the real allocations would also go through. Uh, so in a nutshell, basically, uh, deposit insurance can provide, uh, can prevent bank runs and they provide a risk-free return. The same can be achieved by central bank lending to the banking system. Okay, many thanks. Me. Then more back to Martin. Okay, yeah, so so first of all, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Kuna, that was a great uh, discussion. Uh, and now, okay, 
two clarifications. One is about, so in, um, in our model, the Bruna Meyer, Niepold, and uh, for Gerspark type results on equivalence do not hold. Because if the, so the way that their proofs work is that you say the central bank lends to the commercial banks. Okay? In, in our model, that creates more balance, longer balance sheets of everybody. So that's what that's what invalidates these results in, in our setting. It's, it's, uh, it is not free to just replace um, these um, deposits with lending from the central bank. Um, now that, I, of course, it, it clarifies one more that the balance sheet costs are important. Uh, now, and so so what are they? Well, I mean we we have to ask the question in a general equilibrium model where we, where we have endogenous intermediation. So what is the limit to intermediation? Why isn't everything in an intermediary? Why is there some things held directly? Why, why is there? And so, so, so we think that there's a delegation of uh, control over assets um, creates costs and those costs increase as, as you, so those are sort of proportional to the assets, or at least there is a, a piece of them that is proportional to the assets. I agree that there, there's probably some uh, economies of scale, there, there will be a fixed component, okay? but, but that would be fine for our argument, as long as there is a linear component as well. Um, I also agree that uh, it is, uh, depends on the type of assets. If the assets are more risky, for example, we would expect the balance sheet cost to be larger. And this is something that we've explored in, in earlier work. We have a paper in the JME with Morris Lennell where we look at um, uh, asset pricing uh, when, when banks are marginal investors in short-term bonds. Uh, and, and that also has uh, asset management costs like this that depend on the riskiness of the banking sector that then sort of empirically show uh, that uh, thinking about uh, banks in that way is, is, is very useful for reconciling kind of bank positions and uh, asset price spreads. Um, and so that also goes uh, uh, to Raphael's question some ways that so, so we think that it's important to, to put aggregate risk <coughs> into the picture. And we've done work in this direction before. We haven't done it here. This, this is kind of the simplest um, possible model to make this point uh, of the complementarity. Uh, but we're working on combining uh, the structure of this model with uh, the, the risk um, elements that we had in the previous work uh, to, to provide more of a trade-off with financial stability, which, which I think is, is important for, for sort of a final answer on, on CBDC. Um, and then uh, on use point, I mean, uh, imperfect competition is of course, I think that's very important in this whole area. Uh, there is a nice paper of David Anufato, which, which says you know, the, uh, the, the argument that you were saying, which is that uh, it can, uh, CBDC might just have an advantage in undercutting um, uh, market power of uh, commercial banks. Um, in our context, another very interesting thing, which, which I think deserves more study, is that these credit card providers, the, the guys that, provide, that have the networks, they have this really big uh, market to book values because of these network externalities that they have this kind of natural monopoly status. Um, and so that if there's a lot of market power there, that's also something that's a distortion uh, that uh, this competition uh, could affect. So that, that's sort of another interesting margin that, that we want to study. In the future. But thanks a lot everyone to the, for, the, for the questions, comments. Thank you very much. And the next paper is Best Before Expiring Central Bank Currency and Loss Recovery by YouTube. Uh, can I see my screen? Yes. I, I just don't uh, uh, full screen because I have some tech issue. This is fine, right? Okay, so thanks for uh, including this paper in the program. Uh, this is the joint work with Charlie Ken and Martin. Uh, I'm Yuzhu from Bank of Canada. Uh, in this paper, we want to think about uh, using an expiry date to help loss recovery in the design of the CBDC. So as all of you know that uh, there is interest in, uh, increasing interest in issuing CBDC on the central banks. There is a literature that's fastly developing. And uh, previously, a lot of work uh, basically on 
uh, what's the effect of the CBDs on evaluating that? But recently, there seems to be some trend toward how do you design the CBDC. And this paper fits in this category. And the, in this paper, we, we really try to, want to think about uh, can we use expiry date to facilitate a loss recovery in case that CBDC has an offline, offline payment feature? Uh, so why about offline payment feature? Uh, because several central banks are thinking about that because of two reasons. First, uh, it's about uh, payment resilience. That's in the case of a uh, outage, network outage, no one gets access to the internet. Uh, we want people to still be able to use CBDC to transact. And uh, another thing is for uh, financial inclusion reasons. There are people living in remote areas uh, where the internet is not so good, and we want them to still be able to transact. But, but if we allow for offline payment feature, that creates some complications. Uh, that's the double spending problem. So if you look at the graph, if you are a merchant on the right hand side, uh, they can connect to the internet and the central bank instantaneously. So if I shop there, uh, they can just check on the spot whether the coin I'm handing over is valid with the central bank. But if you are those merchants on the left-hand side, they are probably in some remote re areas, then there is no way for them to check uh, whether the coin is valid or not instantaneously. Therefore, to allow for offline payments but rule out double spending problem requires two things. First, we have to restore the offline balances uniquely in a temple resistant uh, device. And second, it has to be separated from uh, funds that are online. Uh, if we can store it in two devices, naturally I can spend the same coin with one device at one uh, place and uh, with another device and another offline place. Similarly, if it can be backup teams online, I can basically spend it both offline and online. Therefore, that, that basically means it can, the, the offline balance can be only in one device and there is no backup. And naturally, that means uh, if we I lose a device uh, then, or damage the device, uh, I can't get access to the money anymore. So this paper, we try to think about, can we reduce the cost of losses uh, in such a case with a digital cash that have offline payment? The answer is yes, we can do so with an expiry date. Uh, so how it works is really, you can uh, download your money into your offline device and then it's locked online. And if and then there is an expiry date uh, that's set attached to the offline coin, and if, that coin is not claimed online before uh, uh, before it expires, then it's automatically reimbursed to your online account. So that goes back to you uh, if you lost the device. Uh, well, but this would introduce interesting economic trade-offs. We want to study that. As a first slide, it's great because it helps uh, loss recovery. But if you think about it, if I'm a seller, I accept this money. I don't have enough time to upload it before it expires. So it automatically goes back to the buyer instead of going back to my account. Then as a seller, I might be reluctant to accept this offline coin. That would reduce consumption and welfare. OK, so we want to think about this trade-off in this paper. I think about what's the best uh, uh, how to set the uh, expiry date optimally. Okay, here is a nutshell. We don't have an app, but we have a graph of a, a picture of an app. We have some balances, uh, and uh, of that we say 120 is offline. And at the bottom of the app, we have a enable loss recovery uh, option. If we click that, then that attaches uh, an expiry date to the offline balances. That's how it works. And what we find really is if our loss recovery with expiry date could have a, a positive impact on demand for offline balances and consumption and welfare. And what it comes down to how to set the expiry date optimally, it seems it's less costly to set a too long 
expiry date compared to set a too short expiry date. The intuition is quite simple. If the expiry date is too long, uh, what really happens is that if I lock, uh, lose it, I need to wait longer to get it back. But because I'm very patient, that doesn't really mean much. But if it's set too short, there are situations, more situations that the seller find uh, it takes, I, I couldn't upload the money before it expires. As a result, I will reject the money. That means lower consumption. That's really costly. And another thing we also think about uh, uh, if the consumer connect their device to the internet, what type of information they share with the central bank. You can think about that device can share the information where the consumer has spent the money. Uh, then that means if the money expired, the central bank knows uh, the merchant that the consumer sends the money to, so it can be automatically reimbursed back to the merchant instead of the consumer. This helps loss recovery because the seller can get it if it's actually spent, but it can have an ambiguous impact on social welfare because that creates a strategic incentive for the consumer to not connect their device if there is a customer associated with that, that will reduce risk. Okay, so today I'm going to show you a simple uh, model that we just illustrate the trade off of an expiry date. And we are going to focus on an outage event. So it's some uh, disaster, you don't have access to internet. And when I mentioned cash during the talk, I mean a, man, a money balance that can be used for offline payments. You can think about it as a store value in a payment card or smartphone chain. And this cash issues purchases during an audit, but is subject to a loss. Uh, the model has four periods. Agents are risk neutral and the discount future with a discount factor beta. And period zero, the consumer decides his portfolio of offline and online balances. The online balances pays an interest, but the offline balance does not. Uh, after he decides his balances, there is a random preference shock that's realized. A consumer can be of two types with equal probability. Uh, if he's type one, he wants to consume one good uh, and the first period. If he's type two, he wants to consume two goods. And in the first period, first there are two independent random shock realized. Uh, there is an outage that occurs with probability lambda. When it occurs, you can only use your offline cash. Uh, after that, with zero probability, the consumer might lose his device. Uh, after these two shocks are realized, then the consumer buys the good they want from the producer, and consumer may take it or leave it all first. That's just to keep things simple. And they can use online deposit if there is no outage, but only offline cash if there is an outage. And consumption of bond advisor balances, standard cash in advance constraint. And if there is no outage at this period, the consumer can then deposit their offline cash back. In period two, the outage ends if there is one. And uh, the producers may also lose their offline cash with some probability either before they can, they can deposit their cash. Uh, after that, agents uh, can withdraw and deposit cash and the online payments arrives. And at the third period, everybody just enjoys counting their money. Okay, here's the uh, payoffs. The consumer's utility depends on how much he consumes in the first period, that's Q, and his wealth level at the end of the, as the third period. Uh, and the, for each unit he consumes, he has a value V, and he only wants to consume up to his type. Similarly, for the producer, his utility depends on how much he produces and his wealth level. And if it pre, uh, A is how much he produces, and if, if it produces one unit, he incurs cost, which is normalized to beta, just to, to make things simple. Okay, just one note. Uh, if there are more consumptions, welfare is higher. So first, let's look at the case 
with no expiry date, that's also the same as physical cash. There is no expiry date. Then producers will have the chance to upload their money if they accept offline cash. They will accept it first, and the producers uh, price differently based on the payment they are, uh, the consumer is using. If it's online payment, the price is said to be one. And if it's offline payment, the price is a bit higher because producer has to be compensated uh, for the probability of loss if it's offline cash. And then we, we go back to think about uh, the decision of how much money to bring in uh, for the consumers. So the consumer will hold enough cash to purchase one or two units uh, if the benefit just exists, uh, exceeds the cost. The benefit comes from the consumption is outage. So the cash allows you to consume your outage. But the, be uh, the cost in includes foregone interest and uh, the cost from a loss. And one thing I want to say is that to bring enough for the second unit is a more demanding requirement. Basically, it's a, the equilibrium is characterized by two inequalities. For second units, that inequality is more demanding uh, because you only want to consume the first unit with half probability, but you want to consume the first unit anyways. Uh, so let me just skip the social welfare equation. And now let's think about what happens if we introduce expiry date. That's too quickly. So that only lasts for a one period. One period, the cash offline cash expires in period two before the producer get a chance to deposit that money. That just means uh, the producer knows I cannot make it uh, to claim the, the money before it expires. And, and because uh, after the expiry date, the money is reimbursed back to the consumer, so I'm not getting anything anyways. I will reject cash and no transactions during the outage, which just shows that uh, very quick expiry date uh, is very bad. Now, how about the expiry date lasts for two periods? Then, so uh, the merchant, the producer, knows he get enough time to get the money. So his price, the price they send would be exactly the same as if there is no expiry date. And the cash holding for the consumer is higher. Why? Because it's weakly higher, I should say that. Why? Because the cost of loss is reduced. If there is no expiry date, if you lose your offline money, then you lost it. But now you can get it back, but you have to wait a little bit longer uh, after the expiry date has reached. So under certain parameters, that include uh, that will increase the amount of offline cash the agents will bring in, and also increases uh, the welfare, the consumption. Now, so far I have shown you. I have talked about the case as a consumer's device uh, does not reveal too much information. So uh, the central bank does not know he, where he money, he split some money, that if his prior date is reached, the money is reimbursed back to the consumer. But think about the case consumer's device reveals where he spent some money. Then the central bank sees it. And then when the expiry date reached, no one claims the money, the money is automatic. Uh, reimbursed to the merchant if, if the consumer choose to recommit. Then this introduce a strategic incentive for the consumer. He will think, should I reconnect my device or not after the outage? So obviously consumers who spend all their offline cash, they don't want to reconnect because uh, they have nothing in their hands. They want to bet on so the chance the seller lose their device, so the money is getting reimbursed back to their account. But for these consumers who have spent cash, they have to trade off the interest. If he, uh, if he deposit back, he can earn interest for one period. But if he does on the unspent balance, but if he does not reconnect, uh, that means he can bet on the chance that if the seller lose his offline devices. Okay, so 
he would reconnect only if the interest is greater or equal than the, the probability of a, a loss. If that's the case, then the producer knows that mm, they will get the cash because the seller, as a buyer, the consumer will reconnect, they will get the cash anyways. So they are not worried about the loss event for their device. They will charge a lower price uh, for, for the goods. And then the seller, as a, per, as a, as a the consumer, can bring less and consume the same amount. That's great. Uh, but if the opposite is true, the, the, equally, the, the price would be exactly the same as before, but the, the complicated thing is the consumer would choose not to redeposit his unspent cash. If there is a cost associated with that, that will reduce the wealth. Okay, we have a small model just to think about the uh, trade-offs. And then we want to think about what's the optimal expiry date, uh, what's the quantitative implication. We need a more complicated model. So we, we, we build one with an infinite horizon. There is a random outing that occur, it's purely that can occur. And the, the length of that outage is random, okay? And the loss is revealed as the beginning of the outage. So producers will reject cash if the outage is longer than the expiry day. So if the money expires before the outage occurs. Now you can think if you set a short uh, uh, expiry day that's too short, then if a lot of outages, you would not be able to consume anything. That's really bad. And uh, I will skip the model. And I will just say we conduct an online Google survey. We find 16 point 16 percent people lost or damaged their payment card last period, and about 8.5 percent people lost their phone or damaged their phone in the previous year. We use these numbers to calibrate the loss probability for the for the consumer. Okay, let me just show you the graph of consumers with. Uh, a graph of consumer welfare with an expiry date. And the horizontal line is that the P is the length of the expiry date. How long the money is, offline money is valid. And the blue line is a welfare as a function of that expiry date. As a dashed red curve is uh, the welfare without an expiry date. So that's like uh, physical cash. And you can see that. Uh, compared to the first two things. Uh, first, compared to the dashed lines, blue line can have a higher welfare, much higher welfare actually, uh, when the P is set optimally. Okay. Second, you can see the welfare increases dramatically when P is small, but then flattens when T is high. It's not really flattens if we room out a little bit. That's the uh, that's right panel of the picture. Uh, we actually see that curve just declines, the welfare declines, but it's ju just it declines slowly because the discount factor is high. So this, this basically shows that this asymmetry, asymmetry in, the optim uh, in, the, in the experiment, if you say it a little bit longer than optimal, that's fine. But if you set it a little bit shorter than the optimal, that's very costly. Okay, so I'm pretty much done. Uh, let me just conclude by saying uh, we are thinking about the loss recovery to add uh, to aid the. Oh no, we are thinking about uh, looking at expiry date to aid so loss recovery in the case uh, that the CBDC wants to have an offline payment feature. We we find it is useful, and we have some insight on how to set the expiry date optimally and how to structure the information that's sent to the central bank. Thanks. Thank you very much. And the discussion is Samit Aligishev from the IMF. In the meantime, let me just read out a question by Gina Peters from Chicago. Um, the sand dollar, Bahamas sand dollar CBDC is designed with offline online access in mind. Would you happen to know if they use this expiration approach in their solution? 
very specific question. Yeah, I, I just look up, I don't know the concept, but I just look up uh, their website. Just since they didn't mention anything about expiry date, they say something you need to authorize the amounts you can spend in the offline payment, but, but they don't mention anything about expiry date. I think I read something about the PDOC's BCEP. They also say they, at least they have a patent for Bluetooth. Uh, based payment method that basically means you have two ball, you yeah. can use Bluetooth. But I don't really yeah. know whether they, I don't think so. I, I happen to remember that, that the Bahama cent dollar for the, I mean, either it's fully identified or it's identifiable with uh, an email or a cell phone. So I guess that would be the recovery angle there. And I'm not sure whether they have offline online. Uh, given the hurricane, yeah. I, I, I know that's one of their goals, but I'm not sure whether it's part of the current technological implementations. Um, I mean, it's still not back. Let's please panelists raise your hand and our TV attendees use the Q&A box. Um, no, I think, you know, this is, this is super interesting. Again, right, it's, it's one of these questions where it's so easy with cash and with CBDC, you suddenly have to think about all these design elements and what is it actually that you want to achieve? How can you achieve it? And what are the underlying economic trade-offs? And, and it's, it's really interesting to see that. Um, in, in, um, how sort of, what is the, the most likely technological implementation that you've been thinking of? Is that like a separate device and, and you can answer more broadly, or is it really a cell phone hosted wallet? Because yeah. I, I feel like you know people are not going to trust uh, when it comes to anonymity anything that's hosted on a cell phone, right? Because the data is there, right? Uh, and you can wrap it any way you want. So it needs to be on a, on a separate device. Uh, I mean, that's the only way I would really trust a CBDC to be sort of offline anonymous. Yeah. Um, of course, with I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, uh, I think we cannot rule out the possibility of using a cell phone, right? That seems like a common thing people use. And also, according to the survey, it's not lost that often, so it's a good thing <laughs> compared to cards. And a lot of cell phones, they have this chip uh, security chip on it, so you can trust it's safe. And these Apple phones, if you lose your phone, these Apple phones has very good say, password and stuff like that to make sure the data is, is safe. It's generally really hard to tap into. Uh, so I would think a cell phone would be a valid option. Of course, a payment card is also uh, possible, and in fact, it might have some advantages in terms of power outage, because you don't need to charge them as often. Uh, but but, but uh, I, I would say I wouldn't rule out both options. Let's give this a try. In the meantime, do we have a, do we have a raised hand on a question? Obviously, now it's a bit unstructured, so people might be. Uh, but uh, here we have. Um, notice we have. Uh, Martin has wants to. He wants to answer a, a question. Uh, speak a, uh, raise a question on your paper. <laughs> yeah, per, per, it's not a it's not a raise a question, but kind of just to kind of, I think further respond to you uh, to answer your question. So, uh, of course, um, like I think at the Bank of Canada, we take like a really broad approach. So, um, like. A, Having um, having a CBDC on a, on a on a smartphone uh, would be a very logical thing to do. But then, uh, for financial inclusion purposes, uh, we might be thinking about also having actually uh, user uh, devices uh, that are separated. Could be cards. Could be kind of a small um, a small little device that actually makes you allows you to make uh, transactions, a peer to peer transactions. Um, so that's kind of like. Like we're really taking that broad, broad approach, and then from the the paper's point of view, actually, it's kind of agnostic about whether 
um, whether the accounts uh, and the offline money is actually tied to an identity or not. Uh, so our setup, it would work both in a situation where you're where you're actually withdrawing the offline money uh, as a person, and that would actually be reg registered to you, um, and where you could link it to uh, an online account. Um, that's okay, also wait, registered sorry, to your name. We have a little echo here. I think we have Sunny. In the meantime, I've already announced, um, you know, next year we're going to be in, in at UPF Barcelona. I look forward to seeing everyone in person <laughs> and uh, it just demonstrates. Sounds uh, great. <laughs> the, the, the analog world still has some advantages in addition to beers after the meeting. But maybe but I can I, just start without the slides. Yeah, maybe just, maybe just talk a bit and, and give us your, 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 your the, the takeaways. Sure. Um, so, uh, Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this very interesting and very well written paper. And once again, apologies for the technical issues on my side. Um, so all of those like myself who at least once lost a wallet would appreciate Bank of Canada spending time on researching this type of CBDC design. Given the data limit, uh, given the time limitations, I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna go through uh, the main points very, very quickly. So this paper ultimately studies the allocation of monetary balances between offline and online CBDC accounts, where the optimal allocation is affected by the probabilities of losing access to the offline balances, probability of experiencing electricity outages, in other words, losing access to the online balances, opportunity cost of holding cash, and so on. Authors provide a very nice overview of incentives faced by CBDC users in this setup. And they study the effects of introducing an expiry date on the desire to hold, use, and accept offline digital currency. Here, the expiry date would allow a central bank to reimburse CBDC balances that were lost due to the device malfunction, theft, or simple carelessness. So and interestingly, the problem of loss arises as a consequence of the necessity to eliminate the possibility of double spending and necessity to, pro to provide citizens with the resilient CBDC. In other words, by resilience, authors mean that this uh, CBDC could be used in absence of electricity or internet. Uh, it is worth mentioning that authors approach the idea of CBDC expiration differently compared to other policy discussions, and I find found that very, very interesting. So usually you would see expiration of CBDC entering topics like how do we boost consumer expenditure at recessions, right? Whether we assign an expiration date so that uh, market agents have to spend the money and they cannot save it uh, until better times. So in, in analyzing all those uh, incentives, authors construct two types of models, a finite period model in which these allocations are chosen optimally to maximize the measure of welfare. Um, and this allocation can be also affected by a CBDC design. In this case, by minimizing losses associated with losing cash uh, through setting the expiry date on the cash balances. I can emphasize two main results of the paper. So first of all, authors show that introduction of an expiry date can indeed affect demand for offline CBDC holdings, uh, since they bear advantages uh, of cash and can also be recovered if lost, unlike cash, unlike physical cash. But this comes with a warning that design matters. So, which brings me to the second point, the second result that if that uh, small deviations from this optimally set expiry date are strongly asymmetric. Um, so, on the one hand, CBDC users strongly dislike designs when the CBDC expires, when they are still planning to stay offline and use it. On the other hand, the model setup de delivers a case in which the welfare is not severely affected because they are patient. So I, looking at the charts, I, unfortunately I cannot show you the, the slides, but looking at the, one of the major figures in, in the paper, the one that shows the change in welfare and CBDC holdings, uh, depending on uh, the expiration date that is set and the deviation of this expiration date from the optimally uh, chosen one, um, it is very surprising that the welfare loss is very small, even if 
CBDC holder is locked out of his offline account for almost up to 750 days, which uh, sort of brought me to an idea. Although I, I, I like the paper very much, and I think that it is a very well-written, very focused paper where all the incentives are uh, brilliantly linked with the model and explained in great detail in a very straightforward way. Um, I think the, by construction, the results are slightly uh, skewed towards being towards showing this asymmetry. So for instance, right, we are looking at the perfect foresight uh, when it comes to this outage happening. Once it happens, then you know the duration of the, of, of the outage that's gonna take place, which makes producers uh, being able without any uncertainty to decide whether they want to accept this CBDC given the expiration date or not. On the other hand, you have a very, you have a rather small opportunity cost of holding cash, which comes from the calibration. And the inflation is not considered by the analysis at all, both directly and indirectly. So directly authors assume that inflation, uh, assume zero inflation. Indirectly, they assume that uh, the interest rate is constant and basically calibrated uh, according to the <clears throat> inverse of the discount parameter. So what I, I wanted to show you um, a figure with, with inflation rates uh, across the world to show that although this setup is, uh, is very representative of the advanced economies, it may not necessarily be as representative for the developing world, especially in cases where you have average inflation rates like 14% or 11% uh, for certain regions like the Sub-Saharan Africa or Middle East or Central Asia and Caucasus. So in all those cases, if you are locked out of your offline holdings for seven and 750 days, assuming an inflation rate of 14%, almost a quarter of your holdings will lose its real purchasing power. So it is hardly, um, you can hardly imagine that people living in those countries in the developing world wouldn't lose welfare while waiting for the expiration date, 750 days. So uh, this could be a potential way to extend the analysis if you explicitly incorporate the inflation rates in it. And it would make it representative for other parts of the world apart from advanced economies. Um, that is, I think, basically what I was trying to say in a very, very condensed form and without any materials. Uh, so apologies for that. And uh, I'll conclude here. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Let's conclude this session. Um, keep in mind, right, the CBER meeting continues um, now at 10.15 or 16.15 in CET time. Uh, we, we have a, a session on sustainable finance and fiscal monetary policies. Uh, then later uh, at 12.30 or 6.30 p.m. Uh, European time, we have fintech and financial inclusion. And uh, that's going to be the last track. And obviously, also besides this innovation and digital currencies track, there are lots of interesting sessions going on. I very much thank everybody here who attended. And I will now go to the next section. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you. a lot for presenting. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you, Samit, for the, for the discussion. I, we will follow up by, uh, by email. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.